It is my distinct pleasure now to welcome to our historic presidential candidate forum here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, focused on people with disabilities, right? Um, it is my pleasure now to welcome New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you. This is incredible to see us as a Democratic Party to evolve, to begin to have forums that are far more inclusive. The whole theme of my candidacy is about this ideal that in America, we need to have a revival of civic grace. We need to have a more courageous empathy for each other. It's this understanding that in the United States of America, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I am sitting here right now, running for President of the United States, where I could be the first person ever to occupy the White House that is a descendant of slaves. And it was slaves that built the White House. And, and, and literally, I am here because people fought for my rights. People who weren't black. People who understood that my rights and their rights were interwoven, interconnected, because we are one nation under God. And so for me, we still have a lot of work to do in this nation. And for people with disabilities, we have a hill to climb. There's challenges before us. I'll give you the example. Just as a United States Senator, as I began to, to hire people that in a more inclusive fashion, we saw that the United States Senate office was not ADA compliant. If the people that we need to be making the laws don't even have the office buildings that are ADA compliant, we have a problem. And, and so from my time as a mayor to my time as a senator, and you can darn well be sure as your president, these are the issues that are going to be at the core of my focus for our country. And the last thing I want to make clear, because of the intersectionality within our nation. We know that the issues of empowering people with disabilities also empowers people all across the board. I made a decision in my life to uh, live in the tough inner city community in which I still live. I live in a neighborhood that's below the poverty line. And I understand uh, that you can't pull out environmental issues, issues for Americans with disabilities, issues of race and race relations, brokenness of a criminal justice system, brokenness with our health care system. All of these issues are interwoven. And so we do, uh, we are a nation that has common pain. And we've got to make sure that this election is about returning this nation to a greater sense of common purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Americans with disabilities face many obstacles and barriers to voting, including inaccessible polling places and voting equipment, difficult get, difficulty to getting to the polling place, and poorly informed election officials and poll workers about access issues. But if campaigns were addressing the disability community like any other minority group, they might be more compelled to vote, and that could swing an entire election. What would you do to ensure that people with disabilities will have equal access to this fundamental right to vote? Uh, I, I, again, th this is deep within uh, the culture of my family as well as in our larger nation. Um, we are actually at a point where we see issues of voting rights being rolled back in this country. We, we saw the horrible uh, uh, gutting of the Voter Rights Act uh, by the Supreme Court. And before the ink was even dry, we saw uh, uh, states from Texas to North Carolina designing voting laws to disenfranchise uh, African Americans. In fact, in North Carolina, a federal judge said that they designed the law with surgical-like precision in order to undermine uh, 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 and exclude the, votings of, uh, the voters of, Afri of African American descent. And so I want everybody here to know, and this is my pledge, I have told people time and time again, if I am President of the United States, we will work to pass a new voter rights law in the United States Congress, and I will sign it on my desk. And clearly, hold on for a second, clearly, <laughs> that must be about including Americans with disabilities as well. 
So Americans with disabilities, black and Latino Americans, Americans who've been excluded from the process, we need to make sure that we have a new voting rights law in our land that makes sure that accessibility issues are fundamental. Because no matter what it is, whether it's the, the past dark past we have with denying the suffrage to women, whether it's a dark past we have with voting rights, we must come to a day in our country where every American has free and robust access to polls. Thank you. If we don't have access, we can't vote. Amen. Climate change is, in, is intensifying the frequency and duration of disasters around the world, including the United States. In 2017 and 2018, the U.S. experienced 122 major disasters. People with disabilities and older adults are disproportionately impacted by disasters, during which there are two to four times more likely to die or be injured. Yet, disability and aging communities are excluded from disaster preparedness, planning, response, and recovery. Under your leadership, what policy changes would you make to ensure that people with disabilities have full access to programs and resources before, during, and after disasters? So th this is not an uh, intellectual issue for me. I, I was the mayor of New Jersey's largest city during, national cr during, di during uh, uh, what were declared national disasters. Hurricane Sandy came through my city. and. It was one of those moments where we realized that so much of our city was not prepared for going without power for, for long periods of time. We didn't have communication systems that were set up. And for some of you that uh, I meet people all over Iowa that were following me back on Twitter back in those days, we were literally using social media to track down and find people that were in crisis people that were stuck on high uh, levels uh, because elevators weren't working uh, so that our teams could get out there and find them and rescue people from uh, dire situations. It made us really acutely aware that we had to design better systems that dealt with, and, and I love how you asked the question, dealt with disaster preparedness, systems and procedures during disasters, and especially, especially recovery afterwards. And so as, as President of the United States, because I've been dealing with these issues in the recovery after I got elected to the Senate a, about a year after Hurricane Sandy when the recovery process was still going on. As President of the United States, I'm telling you right now, there are so many federal agencies that must begin to prepare uh, for disasters and must make sure that we have plans for people with disabilities. And that involves FEMA. It involves the transportation associ uh, uh, the uh, federal transportation uh, 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 measures. It involves making sure uh, that we are funding uh, uh, infrastructure investments. It means that we have to continue the push and the fight in this country to make sure we are ADA compliant. It means uh, efforts for our schools. I will make sure that we have a comprehensive plan to deal with those disasters that are coming in our country with a frequency now that is rising. We are a nation that is seeing here in even Iowa, these 100-year storms are now coming every few years. We have to begin to invest in resiliency. And resiliency means to make sure that every single American uh, is prepared for these disasters as they come, is more resilient when they hit, and that we are all in it together for the recovery. Thank you. People with disabilities make up a significant segment of our society, and yet for far too long have been largely excluded from politics. In 2016, 62.7 million eligible voters were expected to either have a disability or had a household where a member with one, or had a household with a member of one, according to research at Rutgers University. In other words, more than 25% of the total electorate has a personal connection to a disability. There are only a few recognizable elected officials who have a visible disability. Senator Tammy Duckworth, Rep uh, Rep Representative Langevin, and Texas Governor Abbott. So the question becomes, what are your plans to increase employment opportunities for people with disabilities? Right, so, so first you, you lead by example, right? You, you make sure that, that you are being the leader you say you are. And that's why at my office, and I just had a conversation with my, my uh, former chief of staff who's now on my campaign about these issues. And this is why I began in my opening statement about when we started, when we got to the Senate and we were looking to make sure we were inclusively hiring, 
uh, that we realized that we weren't even prepared for that, that the Senate office that we were assigned wasn't ADA compliant. Um, you are going to see a person that makes a determination as your president to make sure that their cabinet reflects the full diversity of America and is looking to make sure that we are including in the White House uh, people who are reflective of all the beauty of our country. Now, let me say something more than that. I, I again, I understand this as an African American that you can't make policy about us without us. And, and, and so I, I've been a champion on these issues for a long time. I got to the United States Senate and I saw there was a massive lack of diversity there and begin to push to make sure that we are opening up the doors of diversity in the full reflection, the full wonder of our, of our community. And so as a person who's going to become President of the United States with an eye towards understanding uh, the powerful discrimination that continues to go on with Americans uh, uh, with, with disabilities, uh, from our schools to the workplace, I'm going to make sure that the policy is being made uh, by, by people who have, uh, Americans who have disabilities. Let me make a final point here because I think it's really important. Um, I, I am sitting here right now because people fought for my housing rights. Six, 50 years ago to the date, 50 years ago in 1969, my parents were looking for housing and were denied housing because of the color of their skin. Now I went to, they, we were helped by a group of uh, people in northern New Jersey who helped do this and I got to the Senate and I did, decided to do what a lot of senators do that have a high sense of self-regard. Uh, <laughs> I, I decided to write a book. But you know, when your name is Booker, it's a lot of pressure on writing that book. You, you guys can appreciate that, I'm sure. And so I went back to find the person who led the group that helped my family move in. And, and she was easy to find, because at 92 years old, she is still head of the Northern New Jersey Fair Housing Council. <laughs> but, but here's the kicker. I asked her, well, what kind of cases are you representing? There's lots of black people in Bergen County, New Jersey now. And she goes, well, I'm fighting for Americans with disabilities because of the discrimination they face in housing still to this day. It, she understands that justice in our country has no color, no race, no orientation. Justice means everyone, not just us. <laughs> and, and this is the conviction that I have. People who built the bridges and wonder over which I cross to show respect, I can't pay it back, but I gotta pay it forward to fight for this day until every single American has justice, that we are a nation with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. When the IDEA was passed in 1975, Congress pledged to finance 40% of the differential cost of serving students with disabilities. At best, it's been about 18% at best. Well, actually. Okay, tell yeah, me. Okay. Tell me. Uh-oh. 19% right. in 2010. Ooh. But that's okay, sorry all right. about that. Yep. I'm a percent off. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. That's, that's okay. Yes. Higher levels of funding will ensure more students with disabilities receive the supports they need in K through 12 and are able to complete high school, have an opportunity to go on to post-secondary education and post-secondary employment. This uh, disproportionately uh, affects um, people of color as well as people in the deaf community. And thank, thank you for saying that. Yes. I, I, I just want to jump. You don't even need to put the two, two minute up there because I'm going to be... I'm going to be, this is going to be the quickest answer. I feel like getting up because this gets me so upset. So I pledged from the beginning of this campaign to fully fund the IDEA, period. Fully fund the 40%. Because, again, as a mayor of a major city that is majority black and brown, majority low income, I see the disadvantage that's heaped upon communities like mine by not fully funding this. And it's enough. I'm sick and tired of a, of a, gov a federal government that makes promises and does not keep them. We will fully fund this. I will fight in Congress to make sure they not only appropriate the money, but they make sure uh, that that money gets to the communities and the people that actually need it. How was that for cutting my time? So thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we ha I have a question that I would uh, like to have asked by Gretchen Reck Brown, who is a deaf advocate, and she will be voiced by S Sue. Uh, yes. 
I was giving my marching orders by Vanya sitting over here, who is watching me intently and videoing for sure. <clears throat> the deaf community is facing a crisis with our deaf children. More than 90% 90, 90 of our deaf children are born to hearing parents. Those parents have never often met a deaf person in their life. They have no idea of how or what they're dealing with. And by the time they, they get to the place that their child needs educated, we're seeing deaf adults who are actually not The, they have a medical perception of those children's deafness. And they know, in fact, that that's not how it is. We're good. So what I want to do, what my question is today, is that paying attention to the language deprivation of children, that we want to see access for those children um, in schools. They are missing, uh, they're missing so much language. In fact, they're missing all of their language. What can we do at a federal level to ensure that our children are actually being educated with language? So, th we should get we should give applause for that, and th and thank you as well. Um, okay. Again, this gets me very emotional because I've dealt with these issues for my entire career as a mayor of a, of a major American city. And, and when my city, which is a low-income city, you, you see parents who are struggling with these issues. And, 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 and New Jersey is one of these strange cities that has, is one of the top two per capita income states in America with two of the lowest income cities in America. And so you could literally be a few miles apart and to have a beautiful child with a disability to a low-income family, the resources you have access to are so different than being a, a beautiful child born with disabilities to a family that has lots of resources for that child. And I have a fundamental belief in America that no matter what zip code you were born in, no matter what the wealth of your family, everybody should have abundance of resources so that you could nurture the genius that you were born with. And, and so this is why I get very um, excited about these questions is because I see how we are failing our children, failing their genius, failing their wonder, and failing their potential because of that impotency of empathy in this country for our beautiful children. And, and so I, this is a, a, a big answer, and I'm worried about my friend over there with a the one minute sign, but I'm gonna give you a 30 second sign. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you just a really quick. I want to revolutionize the resources that, uh, that low-income families have. I want to change ideas of making sure that everybody has economic stability, expanding the child care allowance, expanding the earned income tax credit, expanding the renter's tax credit to give working class families and low-income families a lot more resources. I want to make sure we change our long-term care laws to make sure that we have uh, that home caregivers have more resources. I want to expand educational opportunities and stop the insanity in this country uh, of thinking that education starts at kindergarten. It doesn't. It starts in the womb. <laughs> making sure that every single person has access to prenatal care, every single person has access to paid family leave, affordable child care, uh, 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 make sure that they have universal preschool in our country. And when I say these things, I'm talking about preschool and child care for all of our children. And I want to make sure that when children are coming up with special needs, that their families have Medicaid and Medicare systems that support them where they are. We have a system now that forces families into poverty just to qualify for the programs we have. That makes no sense whatsoever. And so as someone who has been dealing with this on the ground in, 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 in communities that are low income, I'm going to transform these realities to make sure every American family can do what our country should stand for, which is our most valuable natural resource, is the genius of our children. And whether it's a child with disabilities, a child who's a minority, or the child who's, every child has that infinite potential of their genius, and we as a country should do a better job making sure we're supporting that, and I will do it as, as, as United States President. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Dr. Cindy Hanawalt. I'm immediate past president for Lynn County Medical Society. 
We appreciate you being here and speaking with us. We're going to switch some of the questions now um, to focus on health care. Thank you, Doctor. So I just want to start by recognizing the community of Cedar Rapids. We are very blessed here to have two large free clinics. And so we provide health care to many uninsured, but a lot of underinsured individuals. So my discussions with you today, do you have plans for making revisions or expansions to the ACA? Um, so I want to be very clear. I, I'm one of those folks that supports a single payer system and to find a way to make sure that we, that we end the nightmare in this country of having such major gaps that people are falling through. But I, I'm also going to sit here and tell you that we can't even make an agreement on that from the 12 people on the last debate stage. And I can tell you, I'm a United States Senator. I know my Democratic colleagues. Our caucus would be split. And so you can't even get the Unified Democratic Caucus on this. It's going to be hard to pass any legislation right away. And so I believe that my job as your president will be to continue to build upon the ACA to start trying to take other leaps. President Obama grabbed the baton and and, and advance the cause of, of health care in our country, the next president must pick it up and continue to advance towards what my, think, my thinking should be the goal of this country, which is to make health care a right for every citizen. And so there's a lot of things that I'm willing to consider, whether it's lowering Medicare eligibility, whether it's providing a public option. But my goal is going to be to continue to do the things that lower costs and expand care. And as a person that had to deal with communities as a mayor, I know the things that actually right now we could be expanding, like federal, federal qualified uh, FQHCs need to expand in our country and their services, uh, like making sure we change Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare eligibility in every way from expanding what we are paying for in reimbursement so that healthcare professionals themselves can get paid more because we're paying a lot of direct health care providers. Some people who are working with are Americans with, with disabilities. Some people that are working uh, with uh, uh, children uh, um, uh, in low-income families. They, they, they make sub-minimum wage, or excuse me, not sub-minimum wage, sub-living wage. I want to make sure that re Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements are more robust so that we can provide more services. So I, I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, I, I'm the only major bipartisan bill that's passed under this president is the one that I led uh, from the Democrat side uh, on criminal justice reform. And don't get me started with the experience that Americans with disabilities have in our broken criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, and, 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 so, and so if I can work across the aisle to get things done that I was told that were impossible when I was, when I was running for this for Senate, uh, imagine what I could do as President of the United States. And I think that as a, as a physician that reimbursement becomes an issue because we've seen too often that individuals are offered some type of coverage, but that doesn't mean they have access. So just giving somebody a health care plan does not mean they can f find a provider that will allow them to be their patient because the reimbursement is, doesn't offset what it costs to deliver care. And so, I mean, a as physicians, as a group, we're trying to understand, we, we believe in all that. We believe everybody has a fundamental right for quality health care, but we're trying to, to understand some of the economics of how is that going to happen. So in order to have more money to put more funding and more reimbursement and, and coverage of, of some fundamental things um, that there's a gap that we're seeing every day in our practices, can you give us any more specifics on, on some of yeah. that legislation? Well, well, let's not talk around the issue. If it, it, what she's saying, in a very, to be very blunt, if every hospital in, in New Jersey had to, had to depend only on Medicare reimbursements, what would happen to most hospitals in New Jersey? They will close, which is happening to our rural Iowa facilities, and that's a problem for us. That is a major problem in rural America and in urban America. I've been going around rural areas from South Carolina to Iowa talking to people about the fact that we have common, much more in common than folks think, and we have common pain. We've got to unite in a sense of common purpose. And, and we're already having a problem with reimbursements in our country. And, and we're also creating perverse incentives because of issues of copay and more. A lot of people put off going to see the doctor until it becomes an emergency, and then their care becomes so much dramatically more expensive, further driving up the costs in our country. And this is why we've got to start having a much more enlightened uh, um, um, system that begins to change the way that we are paying doctors, uh, what kind of reimbursements we're willing to give to cover those services that actually incentivize people to get preventative care, 
early intervention, early detection. We have a system that's based upon treating problems as opposed to a system that's more invested in preventing the problems from happening in the first place. And so as a guy who sees this happening, where people put off their, their care until they end up in my hospital emergency rooms, that's just, that's just a broken way of doing it. And so again, as a guy who ran a city, we were able to lower a lot of costs by doing things in a much smarter way. Lower my jail costs by building affordable housing because supportive housing actually keeps people out of situations that often end up them getting incarcerated in the first place. And so this is where I think we have to have a much different conversation about healthcare in our country. And if we make a lot more strategic investments, we can make sure that we are lowering costs. But yes, the, the, the Medicare system as it stands right now is inadequate, inadequate to deal with uh, uh, the, 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 the health care coverage that we imagine we want for l low income families or families who are struggling. And that has to be reimagined. I'm just one of those folks that knows from actually running systems that we can lower costs and expand care in very pragmatic ways. And the example I, I often give is as a guy who's actually built housing for, for Americans with disabilities in Newark because we had such a housing crisis. We built that housing for, uh, um, uh, for uh, veterans with disabilities in my city from the ground up because I found that veterans with disabilities were costing our city more because they were ending up not just in our hospital emergency room but in our jails. By building affordable, uh, by building supportive housing, which is very expensive as you know, we actually were able to lower the costs associated with our veterans and guess what? We gave them the respect and the dignity that they deserve because when we sing a national anthem to that flag, we say the home of the brave, but so many of our veterans are coming home and they don't find homes for themselves. They're disproportionately homeless. So this is what I talk about when I say the impotency of empathy. It's actually, if you're not a Democrat, you're one of those people, I'm fiscally conservative. Well, if you're fiscally conservative, then you're going to invest in health care. You're going to invest in education. You're going to invest in infrastructure in, in rural areas because all of these things actually provide lower costs overall and start to return uh, to, the, to this country in terms of economic growth and opportunity. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'd like to give this opportunity now for just some final remarks. Uh, uh, um, thank you. Uh, my final remarks are simply this. If you're looking at the people in this field of who to support, it's easy for us as presidential candidates to tell you things that you want to hear. It, it, is, it is important for me when I do hiring to ask people to demonstrate to me what they've done in the past already because that speaks to future behavior. This is not, these aren't new issues. It's not like I had to sit down and write policy papers and I don't already have legislation or, or a co-sponsor of a lot of the legislation dealing with the issues we've talked about. It's not that I haven't already led a city that has a disproportionate amount of Americans that have disabilities. So I want you to know what I am doing. The policy differences between us as, as presidential candidates are small compared to the gulf of differences between us and the person that's in office right now. It, it's not just the head that I'm hoping you will, you will vote for and pick your candidate who to caucus for. I want you to trust your heart and trust your gut. I have demonstrated my entire life as somebody who made a choice uh, coming out of Yale Law School to move into a tough inner city community where we don't confuse wealth with worth. I see the beauty and the dignity and the worth of every one of my neighbors and I know the system is just screwed up and undermining their well-being as well as costing us all as Americans more. I've been fighting on that level playing field for Americans that are left out of the equation. That's my whole career. And I'm not going to be a president that has to go to the White House and learn about these issues. I've been living them. You come to my neighborhood and you'll see the supportive housing we've built. You will see that we don't treat Americans who have addictions with jail and prison, but we fight for their treatment and their care. You'll see that we fight to stop the, the, the evictions of people from housing and understand that housing in this country for all Americans should be a right, like health care should be a right, like education is a right. This has been the cause of my life, and if I am your president, I will make sure that I call to the moral imagination of this country to help us to understand that we as a nation need each other, and that patriotism is love of country. But you cannot love your country unless you love all of your country men and women. And love, 
Love is not an anemic word. It's, it's not sentimentality. Love is dedication. Love is service. Love is sacrifice. Love is understanding that we're all in this together. As Martin Luther King said so eloquently, that today more than ever we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. It's time that we as Americans stop blinding ourselves or covering our eyes and, and not seeing the truth of each other. It's time that we as Americans begin to elevate the beauty and the glory that we are as a people. Because there's no way to succeed, as the old African saying says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. If I am your president, we will rise in the only way that we can rise. We will rise together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Booker. We have, we have a five-minute, hard five minutes. So if you'd like to meet and mingle, over here.